Hello, and welcome to Independent Thinking, the weekly podcast from Chatham House. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. This week, we are looking at the risk of nuclear war. We ask, as one of my guests has suggested, whether the threat posed by nuclear weapons is resurging in a manner not seen since the height of the Cold War. Why are we talking about this now? Well, there are too many reasons. During the recent exchange of missiles between Iran and Israel, it was possible to say at least Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons, but it's on the brink of that capability. In Russia, President Putin has threatened NATO with a nuclear strike if it sends troops to Ukraine, although NATO's Deputy Secretary General called this psychological intimidation. And apprehension is high in East Asia, where years of attempts by America and its allies have failed in persuading North Korea to give up its nuclear arsenal. That came home to me a few weeks ago in Japan when I was listening to a passionate speech by Fumio Kashida, the Prime Minister, warning of the horrors of the use of such weapons from the perspective of the only country to have experienced their use in war. He comes from Hiroshima and is afraid that nearly 80 years on, the world is forgetting just how terrible they are. But at the same time, you hear some officials in South Korea muse if perhaps they can't rely on the US to protect them anymore. Should they get nuclear weapons? How would Japan respond then if its old neighborhood, friends and rivals, had such weapons? And you hear the same kind of calculation in parts of the Middle East. So we're going to talk about the key question of whether the nuclear non-proliferation order in place for decades is decaying, and if so, how do we try to stop it? I've got three experts to help answer these questions. Joining us in the studio is Dr. Patricia Lewis, who heads up our international security program and has spent much of her career writing about this and indeed being involved in talks. Welcome, Patricia. Thanks, Brian. Great to have you here. Joining us too is Professor Robert Kelly, a professor of international relations at Busan University in South Korea. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. And joining us from Berlin is Dr. Hannah Notte the director of the Eurasia Non-Proliferation Program at the James Martin Center for Non-Proliferation Studies. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm really pleased to be joined by you all um, for these questions, which feel in a way like an old conversation, but one that is suddenly top of our minds again. Patricia, let's just start by looking back a bit, taking us up to the present day. Do you think that the treaties to try to discourage the spread of nuclear weapons have worked? I think they've worked well, certainly at the beginning, um, if you take from the Cold War up until the end of the Cold War. But now I think they are really uh, lacking in vision, in capacity and in in leadership, the sort that we need um, in the international system today. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, We are seeing, for example, uh, great leadership in the non-nuclear weapon states in the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I would say also at the Comprehensive Test Ban Organization to try to prevent a resurgence of nuclear testing. That's the kind of energy we need in the international system today. Hannah, the spread has been limited, but not nothing. Can you just take us through what has happened since the treaties were put in place? The war against Ukraine, the full-scale invasion in February of 2022, has sort of brought new salience to nuclear weapons again. It has sort of bifurcated further this camp between those who argue that nuclear deterrence is still necessary. We need it to be safe. You know, we see a recommitment to nuclear weapons in Europe within the NATO alliance, which has expanded. And those who really make the argument for nuclear disarmament, Patricia mentioned the TPNW, a new treaty that is trying to pursue that goal, And those countries have become even more frustrated with the state of nuclear disarmament and the nuclear weapon states not living up to their obligations as these states hold it. And that problem has been around for a very long time. But I would say that it has become further aggravated against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. And now you're seeing proliferation pressures, as Patricia noted, in East Asia, with South Korea and Japan potentially talking about needing such capabilities And then also in the Middle East, we haven't yet seen the emergence of further nuclear weapon states in those past years. What we're really seeing is countries moving towards what you could call nuclear hedging, a policy of nuclear hedging, of building up certain capabilities to give those countries the option to pursue a nuclear weapon at some point down the line. I think this is a problem that we're really struggling with today. Bob, how uh, does this discussion feel live when you're, you're sitting in Busan now? Does it feel academic? Forgive me using that word. Um, you're sitting in a university, or does it? Or does it feel really live 
No, no, it, it, it does. It, it's actually, it's, it's quite a live issue out here, I think. And a lot of that is primarily due to the North Koreans. But I would argue that North Korea is the most dangerous nuclear weapon state right now. And there are nine nuclear weapon states, of course. But, you know, I would argue that North Korea is the most likely to use one of those in any kind of a conflict scenario. I wrote something for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists about six months ago making this argument. We really don't have a good sense of how North Korea operates. We don't have a good sense of North Korean nuclear safety. I mean, you can imagine in a place like North Korea, that nuclear safety is not a high priority, right? Um, you know, we worry about, you know, use, right? We know that conventionally North Korea is very, very weak. There are obvious reasons why if the two Koreas got in a conflict, North Korea would want to use nuclear weapons to compensate for its conventional disabilities. North Korea is very poor. So the possibility of North Korean nuclear proliferation is a problem. We know they were a part of the Khan network sort of on the fringes. We know they've sort of swapped with Iran for, for telemetric data in the past, right? So, um, yeah, I think it's real. And I think the North, the fact that the North Koreans won't pull over, right? I mean, Donald Trump you know, made this big effort. Actually, he didn't really try very hard, but whatever. I mean, supposedly he made this big effort to get North Korea to stop and it didn't work. And I think that sort of fired the kind of hawkish side of the debate here in Korea saying, look, the North Koreans aren't going to pull over, right? You know, we need these things ourselves, right? And I think the Americans, we can kind of arm twist the South Koreans to not do this. But I think the, the structural pressures pushing South Korea and by extension Japan are, are worsening. You've raised lots of things that we really want to come back to, that you've captured this sense that this is a very live debate suddenly. Patricia, I wonder, though, if you could just take us back to the great sweep of this before we dive into these details. In the beginning, of, uh, shortly after the, um, the, the Second World War, there were, there were five weapon states, and they're now the permanent members of the Security Council, the US, China, the so then Soviet Union, and that position now inherited by Russia, UK, and France. And then we, some more countries, but not many, got weapons. Which ones are they? So, first of all, there was South Africa, but they gave them up. There was also uh, India, Pakistan, and of course, we assume Israel, who've never declared. And then there's North Korea. And that's the, that's the status today. There are, as Hannah says, those quite near the threshold, I would say, Iran being one. They have the capacity to go very quickly to a nuclear weapons capability, which it isn't just about developing a warhead. It's also about, you know, whether they would have the delivery systems. Whether that they is have getting a warhead that then could go onto a onto, missile and be controlled exactly. and, and land in yes. the right, right place yes, at the right time. Exactly. There's more to it than just a. Just explosion. making the warhead, yeah. but, they, but they are very close yeah. to that point. Um, and on the Israel point, um, I remember in 2008, uh, I was uh, interviewing Jimmy Carter actually at the Hay Festival in Wales, and he said uh, on a platform that Israel had 150 to 200 nuclear weapons. As you wow. say, Israel has never declared that, uh, but that one paragraph uh, suddenly went everywhere to Israel's annoyance. So I'm using that as my guideline on this. And just on this point, the picture you've described, is is it fair to say it is broadly one of success? It's broadly one of success in control, preventing the spread, but not dealing with the underlying issue. Which is? Which is the role of nuclear weapons, whether or not they deter and they deter in a way that it's worth keeping them or whether the risks are so great because of the huge impact of use that it would be better off getting rid of them. And the world came out in the Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1968 to say the latter. Let's get rid of them. Let's do this through a process of negotiation multilaterally. And we're still really quite a long way from that goal. The counter argument to that would be, look, we need these weapons in order to preserve some kind of stability. Hannah, what's your take on that? Well, that is precisely what the NATO alliance is now arguing, pointing to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is a conventional war waged under the banner of nuclear threats. And of course, the argument or the concern in Europe is very much that, you know, what will come after Ukraine? Might there be Russian aggression against the Baltic states against parts of Eastern Europe. And the only way we can successfully deter, deter Russia and defend against Russia is by keeping on to those nuclear weapons uh, that we have. And it's, it's just very hard in this current environment to make, I think, an argument against uh, that logic as the non-nuclear weapon states uh, are, are trying to do. Because there is this perception that, yeah, the salience of these weapons have, have become in enhanced and um, yeah, it's it's very difficult right now. Would you say that the experience of Ukraine really strengthens that view? Ukraine had control of a share of the Soviet Union 
weapons when the Soviet Union fell apart and it surrendered those in exchange for protection, explicit protection from the US. And now many people think, well, look, what would it have been better holding on to those? What do you think? I can understand that kind of argument, but I can also understand those who continue to make the case for nuclear disarmament, um, arguing really that, first of all, nuclear deterrence and having nuclear weapons clearly enables coercion and enables conflict. That is also what we're seeing in the war against Ukraine. It doesn't prevent conflict from happening. It also spurs further proliferation, potentially, as we're currently seeing, though there are also significant inhibitors against proliferation that we can talk about. So I think there is sort of value on both sides of of the debate, really. Patricia, where are you on this? So what I'm seeing from Ukraine, from Russia's threats, is that nuclear weapons serve authoritarian dictatorships far better than they serve democratic countries with human rights at their center. Because a mad the madman theory of nuclear threats, the madman theory of nuclear deterrence is that Kim Jong-un might just do this. Putin might just do this. And we were worried that Trump might just do this as well. But a, a state that wants to have a world that is safe for its citizens will be extremely reluctant to even threaten the use of nuclear weapons, even in retaliation. You saw Presidents Biden and Macron saying, in the first instance, we would not respond with nuclear weapons. And so my view is that the type of weapons that nuclear weapons are, are just the very type that we've banned under other treaties, such as chemical weapons and biological weapons, landmines and so on. When you say the type, you mean because they cause such awful Yes, they are inhumane. Yes, exactly. And under international law, under international humanitarian law, they would fall very well to have a ban, which is the whole purpose behind the treaty on the prohibition. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, of course, and this is perhaps even more important that we're not looking at enough, is how might we strengthen the taboo of use or prevent use? And China and the US are now beginning to talk about this. And I think that's a very rich theme that we need to explore further and see what we might be able to come up with in terms of at least establishing better controls, transparency, and norms about the use of nuclear weapons. Bob, what do you think about the taboo of use? What has happened? We're now nearly 80 years since these awful weapons were used over Japan. Do you think it is still fresh in people's minds? Uh, that's actually, yeah, that's actually a really good question. I think, I think first use is highly unlikely from most of the nuclear weapon states because most of them have enough conventional capability, enough strategic depth, enough ability to sort of fight a traditional conflict without facing a massive strategic defeat. And that's kind of unlikely. Um, in any case, those kinds of conflicts aren't really sort of fought so much anymore. And so I'm actually less worried about like, for example, I'm, I actually don't think the Russians are going to use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine. I'm not so much concerned that the United States and China would exchange nuclear weapons. What I'm really worried about is smaller states getting nuclear weapons where nuclear weapons are actually a major advantage because they lack strategic depth like North Korea or Israel, right? Where they're conventionally weak like North Korea and nuclear weapons are really the best thing they have. I mean, the Korean case, which I know the best, I mean, the North Koreans really just don't have anything else, right? I mean, their army is really big, but it's very, very out of date, right? Health is an issue, fuel is an issue of spare parts and stuff like that. If the North Koreans don't use nuclear weapons in a conflict, they're basically going to lose. And so that's really my concern. And you said that you regarded North Korea as, as the most dangerous one. Why is that? For precisely this reason, because North Korea is so conventionally weak against, or at least within the, the diet, within the game that the North Koreans are in, right, against their opponents, their likely opponents, the Americans, us, the South Koreans, and the Japanese, North Korea is really, really far behind. And so without nuclear weapons in any kind of meaningful conflict, the North Koreans would almost certainly lose. None of the other nuclear weapon states, I think, are that far behind in their diet, with the possible exception of Pakistan there. But, I mean, North Korea faces the United States. And, you know, and so that is my concern, right? And so they have a very intense use it or lose it dilemma because, you know, one of the things Americans are going to do if we ever fight a war against North Korea, the first thing we're going to do is strike their sites, which means they got to launch their stuff before we bomb it. Right. And they literally have like an afternoon to do it. If the war starts at noon, if they don't have their stuff out of the ground by 6 p.m., it's all going to be gone. Right. And so, I mean, this is actually so I've made this argument a lot here in South Korea that because North North Korea is so conventionally weak, because it doesn't have second strike survivability, they have massive incentives to launch first. And I don't really know what we should do about that. What it's done in South Korea actually is incentivize a preemption discussion right? because if they're going to launch then you should hit them before they launch. And 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 hit them, uh, we'll come on to some of the details of this, but hit them with what? 
uh, shoot down their, their missiles or acquire nuclear weapons as well? No, 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 no because it, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to hit them in the air, right? You want to hit them before they get out of the ground. And so preemption is actually now written in the South Korean doctrine. It's called the three-axis system, and we're getting into the weeds here. But it says we see the North Koreans fueling their missiles, right? And you're in a crisis, and we think they might do it. We, we hit them first, right? And because missile defense doesn't work well enough, because the missile flight time from South Korea to North Korea, uh, North Korea to South Korea is really short. I mean, there are huge incentives for both sides to act first here because both sides are really vulnerable to the other. And that's why, so in my writing, I just bang away at this a lot, that North Korea is, that this dyad, this nuclear dyad is far more dangerous than like the US, Russia or Pakistan, India, because they're massive first use, and this is your question, first use. They're massive first use incentives for the North Koreans that I think there are not in India, Pakistan, US, China, US, Russia. Hannah, when you're listening to this kind of argument, um, we were talking just a moment ago about taboos against use, ways of trying to discourage countries from using these. And I thinking of, I, I dropped down to Hiroshima when I was in Japan and was very struck by not just the museum and things there as people have, but uh, an anime uh, video they, they had which taught in Japanese schools called Barefoot Gen about a boy, a true story of a boy who survived Hiroshima. And it goes into a lot of detail about the physical effects of just about surviving exposure to a nuclear weapon. And for people in Japan say that this is very real, this feels very live. But for many other countries, I suspect it doesn't. We we're talking in quite technical terms here about deterrence and so on. Where do you think this sense of taboo has got to? Well, I may be best placed to answer this question with regards to Russian nuclear threats in Europe, where it's my feeling that we've had two years of near constant Russian nuclear saber rattling. It's been sort of a constant feature on Russian state TV, just, you know, just last week again, threatening to use nuclear weapons against NATO if NATO troops appear in Ukraine, but also by the Russian expert community, where some have even called for preventive nuclear strikes on NATO. And it's been a little bit my impression that because it's been so constant, that it's sort of worn us down. And many think that, you know, Russian nuclear threats are mere bluffs. The Russians are never going to go there. They're never going to do it. And so we've become a little bit, it seems to me, desensitized to this Russian nuclear rhetoric. Now, my argument about this rhetoric is that I think it's to be seen in the context of a, a broader set of Russian measures to really raise the nuclear temperature vis-a-vis -vis the West. We've seen Russia walk away from nuclear arms control agreements. Russia de-ratified the comprehensive test ban treaty. Patricia mentioned the specter of nuclear testing a bit earlier. Russia, when we talk about reducing nuclear risks, is also not very keen to have that conversation that Patricia alluded to with regards to the US and China, which are talking about nuclear risk reduction. Russia is not so keen because I think Russia is not so interested in reducing nuclear risks because it wants to keep that temperature heightened, essentially to convey to us in the West, we are in a completely different era now. There is no more business as usual with you, the West, for as long as, as you su support Ukraine. And so they want to keep that specter high. What I worry about a little bit here is that we're perhaps becoming too desensitized to this nuclear threat. I don't think that it's fair to say that just because we have not seen nuclear use in Ukraine, God forbid, so far, that therefore Russian nuclear use in this war is inconceivable. I think it's important to understand that Russian military strategists, you know, have been saying for a very long time that they foresee using both non-nuclear and nuclear capabilities as part of what they call escalation management within a war at a certain point in time, potentially, you know, and that there's a certain perhaps level of comfort with, with that notion. And so my point to you is that I don't think it's nuclear use by Russia is probable at all in the current circumstances, given how the war is going um, for Russia. But I also think it's sort of dangerous to just talk about a bluff and wish it away and, and say that, that uh, it's, it's inconceivable. I think it's important to stay alert to the dangers. Patricia, what do you make of this? So we've had Bob arguing that, look, the biggest threat is from smaller countries. And we'll come on in a moment to talk about other small countries that may want to get such weapons. And we've had Hannah saying, look, don't underestimate this old rivalry with Russia. And now we have, of course, US and China both refreshing, if you like, their, their arsenals. What should we make of that Russia-China-US competition at the moment? I think Hannah's absolutely right. We would be foolish to discount it completely. I think um, on the, I think part of what we've done is to 
not respond to it with panic. But there is fear. There is definitely fear. And this says to me that um, our decision makers, our uh, militaries are actually worried that deterrence will not hold in this situation. So um, we need to put in place different approaches. I feel we've put too many eggs in the deterrence basket. And we need to start thinking much more about different types of responses, different types of risk reduction, conventional weaponry. I think Bob is absolutely right. When you have, uh, when you, you've hollowed out your conventional weapons, um, you make it much more difficult to be able to respond to things in, in a nuanced way. And we see this also with Pakistan. We haven't mentioned India and Pakistan. Um, but here Not we have briefly. a uh, classic briefly. deterrence situation, if you like, across the, the border. But Pakistan, with uh, no strategic reach really into the big country of India, relies much more heavily on nuclear weapons. And it's a very unstable situation. The problem is, I think, that we've developed this, this thinking about nuclear weapons during a, a Cold War. And we're now in a season of rising hot war. And it doesn't work the same way. And we haven't thought it through as much as we should in terms of our policies and uh, military doctrines. So let's think some of that through right now and talk about some of the other countries which might be going nuclear. Bob, let me ask you, what are the risks of South Korea, or the chance, let me say, of South Korea deciding to get such weapons? Oh, well, they're certainly higher than they've been at any point since this conversation happened last time in South Korea, which was in the 1970s. There is a fair amount of polling data from the last three or four years that says that uh, public opinion is fairly supportive. Certainly South Korean talks are supportive, but I've actually been to lots of conferences here on this topic going again in a couple of months. There was just released the other day, just two or three days ago, um, Victor Cha at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Strategic and International Studies in Washington. They released this big thing about so South Korean nuclear weapons and found that actually a lot of South Korean elites have changed their mind in the last year. So this may be, this is sort of up in the air. Okay. And let, let me ask you, Bob, is, is some of this to do with when President Trump was in office, he seemed to cast some doubt about whether the US would always protect South Korea in the way that it has promised for, for decades. And I remember the sense of shock that caused in South Korea. Is this new debate about nuclear weapons stemming from that? Somewhat. I think, I think it's that. And I think also the turn in the last year, if, if, if Victor's data is correct, I think that's because the Biden administration has been bending over backwards to reassure South Korea. You know, I'm here in the big port of the, the country, right? And U.S. aircraft carriers and submarines are coming here a lot more now than any point in my career here before. And all of that is intended to signal strategic assurance of the rock stars. South Koreans don't have to go for nukes. But yeah, I, I, your, your, your basic point is yes. I would, I, I would come back to your basic point argue that, yeah, there are really two reasons by the South Koreans want them. The first is the general strategic concern that the North Koreans have these things. The Americans might not actually use them to defend us if it meant a North Korean nuclear strike on U.S. bases or even the continental United States, which North Korea can now range. Since 2017, 2018, the North Koreans now hit us in a way they couldn't before. And, you know, we're not going all in on North on Ukraine, for example, in part because we're worried about Russian escalation, you could see the same thing happening here. I think that's the big structural issue, extended deterrence, credibility problems now that North Korea can hit the United States. And then that has been worsened by the Trump administration, right? I mean, Trump has made it very, very clear in his public comments, um, and I've written a lot about this, that, you know, he would like to abandon South Korea. He wants to pull out the, it's very obvious he wants to pull out the U.S. ground contingent. He just said that again a couple of days ago. He would probably pull out the U.S. air contingent too without the ground contingent. It kind of doesn't make any sense to keep the U.S air bases here, right? And if we left completely, that would basically leave the alliance without a U.S. force on the ground. And and that's, I mean, if you're South Korea, I kind of understand why they want them. It's not hard to figure out, right? I mean, you're living next to Russia, North Korea, and China, all with nuclear weapons, right? And Donald Trump's going to be president? I mean... Yeah, I mean, the government of South Korea has not said that it wants them. I, the kind of statement I hear from officials is public opinion might lead us that way if America was not going to guarantee uh, uh, protection and so on. So where does that leave Japan? You know, this awful dilemma, uh, nuclear weapons anathema, uh, not just to the prime minister, but to many in the population. On the other hand, as you said, if the whole neighborhood, uh, potential enemies and, and friends... Uh, acquiring these weapons, what does Japan do? I think right now the answer in Japan is no, in part because of the legacy, right? But if Trump becomes president and Trump actually pulls us out of South Korea, particularly if he breaks the alliance, then the South Koreans will definitely build nuclear weapons and then the Japanese will start to think we're next. I actually don't think that Japanese nuclear weapons will be prompted by South Korean nuclear weapons. I actually don't think that that 
is an issue. I think the real issue is the sense of American abandonment, that if we pull out, right, then the Japanese say, oh, my God, we're next. And then, you know, I mean, if, 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 if the Americans leave, you got a lot of countries live next to China, which are really vulnerable, and a lot of them will be incentivized to nuke up. Hannah, what about the Middle East, which we haven't really mentioned, apart from Israel, but the question of Saudi Arabia, which wants a civil nuclear program, we know it wants that through the normalization it wanted through Israel before October 7th, still wants that that program if it can get it. Uh, Egypt, Turkey, we we've, um, hear these, uh, the UAE even, we hear these uh, questions flickering through debates about security in the region. What do you think? Sure, I think... The biggest concern in the Middle East right now is Iran, so we should also separately talk about that, but happy to talk about about the others. I'm less worried about Turkey and Egypt, to be honest with you. I mean, with Turkey, you know, we've had Erdogan say it at one point, I think in 2019, that it was unacceptable for nuclear armed states to tell Turkey that it can't have its own nuclear weapons. And certainly the Turks are interested in civilian nuclear technology. Uh, The Russians are building the uh, Akuya nuclear power plant. But let's not forget that Turkey is part of NATO. And from all we know, it hosts forward deployed U.S. non-strategic nuclear weapons at Interlake Base. So I'm really hard pressed to see the Turks moving into that direction. It would really require big changes in, in, in geopolitics, I think. The Egyptians harbored nuclear ambitions in the 60s, but they then chose nuclear forbearance. Uh, they are also interested in civilian nuclear technology here The Russians are also building a nuclear reactor uh, at El Daba in the desert. And it's true that the Egyptians have been sort of the longstanding leader in the Arab world on critique of of Israel not signing the NPT. And the Egyptians are a big proponent of a WMD-free zone in the Middle East. But again, I'm hard-pressed to see the Egyptians moving towards a nuclear weapons capability. You know, they don't have the, the infrastructure, the capabilities you know, it's if anything, it would really be a very long-term prospect. So the major candidate, sort of other than talking about Iran, is really Saudi Arabia, which has signaled sort of its intent uh, in the case that Iran gets a nuclear weapon. And it has so far uh, refused to forego uh, the right to domestic enrichment. Its capability at the moment to have a nuclear weapons program is, is very minimal from what we understand. But you rightly sort of hinted at these talks on a normalization agreement uh, involving the US, Israel and Saudi. We knew that a civilian nuclear program was supposed to be part of that package deal. We knew that before Hamas's attack uh, on Israel on October 7th, the parties were getting closer on some sort of package deal that would also have, of course, uh, entailed some sort of defense pact between the US and Saudi Arabia and then normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And, and that's been somewhat stalled, uh, given developments in the Middle East. And, and, and then the Guardian... Somewhat reported, stalled is about right. The Guardian reported earlier this week that now there might be a move towards a so-called Plan B, where the Saudis and the Americans agree on something bilaterally, including something on the nuclear front, and that not being contingent on normalization with Israel. But I think there's a lot we don't know yet. And also the question as to whether this would make it through the U.S. Senate is a big question mark in my mind. Patricia, the non-proliferation regime has always made a big distinction between civil nuclear power and the capacity to get weapons. But I wondered if you thought that these days that was asking for trouble to say a country can have civil nuclear power and we rely on all the treaties to stop that country going further. And Saudi Arabia is the country presenting itself at the moment. I think that um, civil nuclear power is very well regulated and it's regulated for safety, security and for diversion into the military. And the IAEA has done an extraordinary job. This is the UN watchdog. This is the UN watchdog. The International Atomic Energy Agency has done an extraordinary job in in doing that. And uh, civil nuclear power, of course, is important in the mix of energy sources, particularly for baseload energy um, in helping uh, reduce our dependency of carbon. So I think it's really difficult for us to say, let's not have nuclear civil nuclear energy. And there are all sorts of proliferation-resistant nuclear power reactors, and they're the ones that are mostly now in in service. So I don't see it as big a problem as other people do. And so I'm with the Atomic Energy Agency on this. I think that we can manage this. Um, And in fact, the civil nuclear industry, in my experience, would love to see getting rid of nuclear weapons because it would really help them because the word nuclear tends to spark off visions of massive dystopian world as opposed to something that's really helping us meet our climate change uh, demands. 
On the other hand, as we've been discussing, the examples of countries that have given up uh, nuclear weapons, I'm not thinking so much of South Africa, but you, Ukraine, don't encourage others to do it. Would you, uh, in, in Britain, uh, the Labour opposition ahead in the polls has said, look, we're going to keep hold of the Trident uh, nuclear deterrent? Mm -hmm. I think it has to be multilateral. Ukraine didn't have command and control of those weapons. They were not really Ukrainian. Uh, they were on their territory, but it was Moscow that had control. And so the giving up of them was somewhat a political decision. The problem with this, of course, is that it was um, de very dependent on the goodwill under the Budapest Memorandum, where the UK, the US and Russia agreed to respect the territory of Ukraine. And that obviously has been torn up by Russia. And then I would say that the US and, and UK have not defended in the way they could have done earlier for Ukraine's interests. So I don't think it's so much the issue of the the weapons themselves in this case. But I would say um, that I think it's really important um, that we look also at the role of China, because China is helping a lot of countries think about how they might develop their energy capability. And in Africa, in Asia, and in the Middle East, and with Saudi, they're investing more and more in this aspect of things. In which aspect? In in the nuclear, civil nuclear. So in, in which case, you know, we've got a... A, a, if you like, a trade war with civil nuclear in a way, that where China um, perhaps won't have the same kind of concerns that the US has and therefore will be more supportive of countries if they want to go in that direction. That is really, really interesting point. So let's pull this together at the end. And we've threaded through all this discussion, various suggestions for what might improve things and what might th make things worse. But I, I just want to come to the th three of you of what you think Really, in the next year or two, countries that want to stop or reduce the threat of this might do. Hannah, let me start with you. Let me answer that question with, with regards to the Middle East, which is a region I look at. I think if you want to stem further pressures towards proliferation in the Middle East, it's absolutely vital that we keep the Iranians in a box. I think returning to a nuclear deal looks quite unlikely, given geopolitics. Uh, we've sort of lost Russia as a partner on this. I don't see that happening anytime soon, but making sure the Iranians don't go further, I think is going to be the sort of the critical first step. And what does what does that mean? Keeping Iran in a box is a is a metaphor. What does it mean? Actually trying to attack their facilities? No, but I think attacking their facilities might make Iran more likely to go for a nuclear weapons capability at some point down the line. So really what I mean is they have accumulated a certain amount of highly enriched uranium, making sure they don't build that up further or in a better scenario even make them roll that back slightly. And make, making them, it's not easy to make Iran do many things, uh, particularly at the moment, but making them do it uh, through sanctions, through this kind of pressure that other countries have been exerting on them. You know, I mean, there might be an effort to get the Iranians back to a negotiating table as well, but I think it's, it's just not very likely at the moment, given that Russia is not particularly interested in helping that effort. But though we have new, new players, I mean, we have the, actually the, the China brokered deal with Saudi Arabia. Um, do you see any way to perhaps bring some agreement uh, through that? I think China does not want to see Iran having a nuclear weapon. So there is some, some leverage there. The question for me with China and the Middle East is always, are the Chinese going to be willing to use their leverage, whether it's with Iran or with others? We haven't yet really seen that. So that's a test for the future. But dealing with Iran is going to be a uh, important. And then I think whatever materializes by way of US security guarantees vis-a-vis -vis its regional allies to dissuade them from you know, pursuing that path of a nuclear capability, that's also going to be important. Okay. So those are two really important points on Iran, possibly using China and uh, on getting the US to uphold its security guarantees. Bob, what do you reckon? Yeah, um, I think one, the activist community, non-proliferation community should focus on control rather than prohibition. I think the treaty in the nuclear weapons is a sort of a utopian goal. As long as you have really deep political differences in our world, the temptation of reach for nuclear weapons is going to be very, very attractive. We've managed to sort of contain that somewhat over the years, but, you know, countries like Iran and North Korea and stuff like that will continue to show interest, right? You know, if Donald Trump becomes president, I think Eastern European countries like Poland and Ukraine are going to consider it, right? So I think the idea of sort of going for abolition is just a bridge too far, and we should, said we should focus on control and arms control. And I would make really sort of two specific comments here. The first thing, the most important thing, I think, is that the nuclear weapon states need to actually start showing that they really do believe in the non-proliferation treaty and the requirement to build down 
right? And this is a really big problem, the perception of nuclear discrimination out there. We know explicitly, right? By bill down, what do you mean? To, to, to cut. To cut their own stockpiles. Yes, that's correct. In a proactive way, right? And the nuclear open states just really aren't doing this. I mean, you know, I'm an American. The Americans are about to spend something like what? Like a trillion to a trillion and a half dollars building a whole new generation of missiles, right? You know, we're going to sort of revamp the entire American nuclear arsenal, you know, and at the same time, we're telling, you know, South Korea can't build nuclear weapons, even though you live next to North Korea. I mean, the hypocrisy is glaring. I hear about it every time I go to a conference, but the nuclear weapon states have got to actually show some really good faith on this, right? And then when they've established that, I think it will be easier to get us into some kind of arms control. But that's what I would go for. I would go for arms control rather than prohibition, or I try to get some rules, right? And the nuclear weapon states have got to sort of, but they've got to lead on this. And the problem is nuclear weapon states aren't the Americans about to engage in big buildup. The Chinese are doing the same, right? The Russians are making all these nuclear threats. So, I mean, if you're a non-nuclear weapon state out there, you know, in a tough environment, if you're South Korea or Ukraine, you're like, wait, you know, why should I build them too? Right? South Koreans say it to me all the time. It's like, if you guys believe in non-proliferation, why do you have so many? Why do you never give them up? That's a good question. Good point. Patricia. It's a very good point. And I'll take anything that's on offer, frankly, arms control, non-proliferation, disarmament, whatever you, anyone's got. But I think where we really need to focus on is the worst possible outcome. And the worst possible outcome is a nuclear war. So how do we prevent that? And let's put our energy into thinking really today, in today's world, not the Cold War, how we might prevent that. One of the things we need to do in thinking that through is how would we prepare for a nuclear war? In thinking that through, if you look at Annie Jacobson's new book that's just come out, um, where it has a North Korean attack on on Washington, which then, you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, the answer is everything. Um, and it's it's taken the word, I know Robert's laughing, but it's true. And, um, you know, the, the the chain reaction, if you like, to, to use a pun in terms of nuclear. So in preparing for thinking through how nuclear war might come about, we then need to then step back and look at how we might prevent the worst of all outcomes. And that would include, I think, a mix of various restraints, but also, as you say, leading by example. And this is where my normal, you call it optimism, I call it hope, Bronwyn, I, I, it starts to diminish because I see our leaders not being of the caliber that we saw with the Kennedys and so on um, when the non-proliferation treaty was um, put into force where they really worried about the spread of nuclear weapons. And that leadership right now is lacking and that's what we need for our leaders to really put their energy and increase the energy at the international level at addressing this vitally important issue. Patricia, let me ask you just one final thing, the kind of thing I might ask you in the canteen line at the Chatham House, uh, but I know it's one of your special interests. What about the threat of Russia putting nuclear weapons in space? Yes. Well, the thing with nuclear weapons in space is that the electromagnetic pulse that comes from a nuclear blast, which on the ground is very short, in space can go quite far and knock out satellites. So not only would you get a, an immediate uh, pulse that comes from the radiation, you wouldn't get a blast so much in space because there isn't much atmosphere, um, but we all get this electromagnetic pulse that will knock out satellites and therefore all the communications. So is that something we should also focus on controlling now, there is if, already, if at all possible? There is already a treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, that prohibits the placement of nuclear weapons in space. Um, so why they would think about putting that up, I don't know. And why would you need to put one... Why would they, they in, would think about putting what up? A, a nuclear weapon in, in space. space. Because you just need to lob one up there, right? With a missile, you don't need to place them there. So this is a, a puzzle to me. And I think it's, again, what Hannah was saying. It's about Russia keep on uh, trying to raise the temperature, the nuclear temperature, and get everybody worried and frightened by them. We're going to end, I'm afraid, on that puzzle called Russia, but to be continued in lots of our work. Well, look, thank you all for the most interesting, many-sided, not entirely reassuring discussion, obviously given the soberness of what we're talking about, but actually many routes through there where we've talked about things that could be done in a world of these spreading threats. We are going to have to stop there. A huge thanks then to my guests. Bob Kelly, Patricia Lewis, Hannah Notte. Do follow them all on X and their details are going to be in the show notes. If you want to know more about our work on nuclear weapons and non-proliferation, have a look through chathamhouse.org and you'll see Patricia's research paper from her and the team on reducing nuclear weapons risk. And also do look out for, we've had this week, Theresa May, former British Prime Minister, talking about Britain's future and some of its past 
And we have Ban Ki-moon and Mary Robinson of The Elders talking about climate change. You can find all of that on our website as well. And you can find all of our podcasts on Apple, Spotify, all major platforms, as well as through our social media. So do like, follow and subscribe and leave us a review. With that, it's goodbye from me, Bronwyn Maddox. Until next week.